I think most of you know that uh, the designated name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2, and the designated of the disease, B standing for disease, is the coronavirus, the COVID-19. So if you're talking about the disease, you can abbreviate it COVID-19. If you're talking about the virus itself, you can use that term. So how do we assess and forecast uh, circumstances like this? How do we mitigate and cope with them? And how do we influence policymakers? Those will be three themes within the talk. So <clears throat> global climate change is what we call it. But we used to call it global warming. And a clever um, lobbyist who wanted to sort of downplay the term uh, sort of promulgated global climate change. And it's a little more of a scientific term, so we've, we've stuck with it. But you could also call it global warming. There are direct human effects of global warming. Uh, hotter and drier summers with heat-related deaths. You may recall about a decade ago, uh, a heat wave in Europe. And it's estimated that well over 10,000 uh, persons, almost all of them elderly, died from direct heat effects, and they almost all either didn't have air conditioning or had broken air conditioning. Um, and these were high income countries. Uh, warmer and wetter winters uh, with the attendant loss of polar and glacial ice. Increased extreme weather with adverse events that are somewhat less predictable. Uh, just imagine Hurricane Sandy every 15 years instead of every 50 years. Um, and uh, property and crop loss, especially co coastal property. Uh, we also are very concerned about biodiversity issues. Um, if fish have to migrate because their waters are warmer and they have to go to a different part of the ocean, uh, now they're competing with other uh, animals. Uh, and uh, it, and you know the, the loss of, uh, of reef ecosystems has been so devastating globally. That, that there is a lot of um, sort of spin-off effect in terms of the food chain from uh, that phenomenon. So those are global temperature changes from 1880 to 2019. Uh, pretty unremittingly uh, grim in terms of the rise of uh, temperature. And this, this particular um, acceleration is something that all the climate change scientists are really focusing on. So 19 of the hottest 20 years recorded since 1880 have been in the 21st century. And the 20th was in 1998, which is practically the 21st century. Um, six of the, um, the, the, the six hottest years in recorded record have been the last six years. And last year was the second hottest ever recorded. <laughs> If there were trends in cooling, you would see some blue on this map. And it's almost all um, yellow and red, indicating warming. That's what's happened to the polar ice cap since 1980 to 2012. I couldn't find a, a more recent photo. I suspect it looks even more grim. And I think we've all seen the photographs of the skinny polar bears who have to swim to find their food instead of walking on the ice and, and, uh, and are functionally um, starving. Um, <clears throat> it's shrinking about 9% per decade. Um, this is as much in the last 10 years as in the previous 10,000 years. Here is a video, so pay attention just for a moment, uh, of um, Arctic, Antarctic ice loss just since 2002 up until 2016. And you'll see things getting redder as the uh, ice is vanished. We've already had the calving off of an ice uh, block as large as the state of Rhode Island. <clears throat> and there's more to come. The average mass loss of ice from Antarctic, uh, the Antarctic is uh, 125 gigatons per year. Now, I don't happen to know what a gigaton is other than just intellectually. I can't, I can't fathom uh, uh, ice volume that great. It's just not my experience, but it's a vast, vast challenge. 
That's the global sea ice in the last 40 years, uh, also diminishing at, uh, uh, you know, me measured by millions of square kilometers from a better than 7 million to a little more than 4 million at the present time. Now, those of you who are my age remember uh, Ava Gardner in the movie and uh, of the Ernest Hemingway book, uh, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. Well, there aren't any more snows of Kilimanjaro. Um, uh, 1912, um, 1970, uh, 2000, 2007, and now uh, there are no more snows of Kilimanjaro. Now, um, the British colonialists used to go to the foothills of Kilimanjaro and similar parts of Kenya in the most intensely malaria season to reduce malaria risk, but now you can get malaria halfway up the mountain. And this used to be malaria-free, all of, all, of all of the foothills. And that's a simple reality of uh, how mosquitoes survive. Uh, if, I, if, if I'm a mosquito and I bite a malarious individual, It'll take me, depending on the species of malaria, 8 to 14 days for the malaria to undergo its sexual reproductive cycle in, in me, the mosquito. Um, um, the o oocyst in my midgut has to mature the sporozoites, which are released and migrate to the salivary glands, at which point I'm now infectious to one of the rest of you. So the um, increase probability of a mosquito surviving 8 to 14 days substantially increases malaria uh, efficiency, ma malaria transmission efficiency. And uh, you'd be surprised how many more mosquitoes, what a bigger proportion of mosquitoes can, can survive just with a small sort of one quarter to one half centigrade increase uh, in temperature. You can have a, a non-trivial uh, boost 20, 25, 30% more mosquito survival into the malarious uh, time period. So that's what uh, it, we're actually seeing in Africa at the present time. So evidence for global climate change is irrefutable and overwhelming. I would put it at the same level of, 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 uh, of causal thinking as smoking and lung cancer human papillomavirus and cervical cancer, HIV causing AIDS. It's at that level of confidence. And people challenge me, you're, you're a scientist, don't you know you can never be sure? There is a point at which we're pretty sure. And um, that, that human uh, um, uh, activity is contributing to global climate change is a virtual certainty. Um, scientists who disagree are nearly all on the payrolls of the, part of the fossil fuel industry, one way or the other. Either they're getting grants to their university or they're literally on the payrolls. Um, and in the media, if you see Bill Nye, the science guy, debating some random individual, that random individual is typically not a scientist at all. It's simply uh, a politically informed, uh, sort of debate experienced individual Who's, who's, who's trotting out uh, arguments that uh, have little scientific merit. So we're um, in a tremendous challenge to message to lay audiences effectively what the threats to our grandchildren really are here. Now, of all the slides I'm going to show you, including the coronavirus slides, this one is the most terrifying. So there's something called uh, thermohaline circulation, where the uh, cold waters of the Arctic Antarctic are flowing in deep currents and they're, they're, they're coming into the tropical parts of the world, they're, they're coming to the surface, they're being warmed and they're traveling as the Gulf Stream does uh, more superficially. So the country of my parents, it happens to be Norway, you can see that Norway ought to have the same, uh, the same um, climate as northern Siberia and northern uh, uh, Alaska and, and Canada, but it doesn't. It has a much more benign climate. That's strictly because of the Gulf Stream. So, for the first time in recorded history, scientists have measured a slowing of these um, uh, meridional overturning uh, in the Atlantic Current, and we do not know what that implies. We, we just don't know. It's never happened before. We have no scientific evidence. And, and when we disrupt these fundamental ocean cycles, how we're going to disrupt um, sea life, how we're going to disrupt uh, uh, temperatures, no one has a clue. 
and, um, and uh, it is unlikely to be good news. Um, uh, it's easy to see how this will, will feed into um, um, more unpredictable um, uh, temperature and the like. So I wanted to highlight five health issues for you after that fairly grim introduction. Uh, one is the direct effects that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, heat waves that are more severe and more frequent. Uh, they will affect young children and the elderly more than others, especially people who don't have air conditioning or have broken air conditioning. Um, and uh, you get breakdowns in high demand times and you simply don't have the workforce to be able to snap your fingers and instantaneously fix everybody's air conditioning in the middle of a heat wave. Um, number two, we have climatologic displacement. Um, farmers, grazers and ranchers, fisher folk, um, who can no longer make a living and support their families in the environments in which they live. It's already happened in the Sahel, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. Uh, Low-lying ocean cities, uh, the AOSIS is uh, the Association of Small Island States, uh, get the last um, um, a letter, and you can look that up online and you'll see a whole list of nation states whose primary foreign policy uh, uh, issue at the UN and elsewhere is the fact that they're perceiving that they could go away. Their entire country could, could be gone in 20 to 50 years. It's already happening in Mauritius. It's already happened to a number of the Marshall Islands that have um, had to have their entire populations uh, moved. There's actually a small um, Native Alaskan community near Nome that they're talking about a $20 million investment to move the entire town inland because it's going to get washed away. Um, so it's not a future issue, it's a current issue. Uh, we also face drying lakes and rivers. And uh, a third uh, health issue is extreme weather events, uh, monsoons, glacial, glacial water melt, storm surges, cyclone severity, and the realities of those. So fourth is what I mentioned earlier, vector-borne diseases mosquitoes, ticks, and others uh, that will simply live longer. And uh, we can expect uh, malaria and arboviruses to go up. Arboviruses, arthropod-borne viruses, arboviruses, things like yellow fever and the dengue and the like. And then we have number five, population pressures, uh, drought, famine, large-scale migration, civil unrest and insecurity. If a region cannot sustain the population that is in that region, those people will move. Um, drought preceded the civil war in Syria. People forget that. Three years of unprecedented drought in Syria was a very strong uh, sort of antecedent event to the uprising. Now, um, uh, al-Assad was, was a jerk one way or the other, but uh, people were putting up with him. And when the droughts came along, uh, there was an acuity of awareness of the lack of political leadership. And, uh, and many, many people more knowledgeable than I think that that was fueling uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the civil war, if you will, uh, which hasn't worked out too well for the, uh, uh, the uh, protesting combatants. Uh, similarly, the Sahel migration, we've all seen the photographs of folks piling onto uh, miserable little ding dinghies and, and, and old uh, decrepit boats in Libya. And uh, these are Africans. And what you may not know is they're mostly from the Sahel. So a dis if a, a uh, disrupted family that used to make a living on the edges of the Sahara Desert, Sahara Desert migrating south about 100 kilometers per year with desertification, as we call it. And uh, they'll send their, their, their most promising young man uh, to Libya to try to get to Europe and, and make money and send money back because they are no longer able to feed their families. So we ain't seen nothing yet in terms of the global security crisis. Let me mention uh, glacial changes and use the Himalayas as an example. So um, you can see by the orange and, um, and darker orange, I guess they're all orange, um, um, red, reddish, uh, uh, where we have the greatest loss of glaciers in the Himalaya. 
And what I want to, is it all right if I step away from the mic for a minute? So this is the Mekong River Basin. This is the Brahmaputra Ganges River Basin. And this is the Indus River Basin. So here we're in uh, Pakistan mostly, here we're in India and Bangladesh, and here we're in all of Southeast Asia. There are, just in the Gandhi, Ganges Brahmaputra River Basin, there are half a billion people currently living there. And in the entire four river basins, there are a billion people on the planet Earth. And what is happening is that the snowmelt onset and the end dates are coming earlier in the year. That's already been measured by a group, uh, a very sophisticated work coming out of Potsdam uh, University in Germany. And, in the, in the, and that's in the context of overall glacial shrinkage and warming of the Earth. So the snow melt period, the amount, the amount of time the snow takes to melt off is shrinking, about a three week shift. Um, and trends show less snow in general, uh, melting earlier and faster. And there is the phenomenon when you used to have white snow or ice reflecting, and now you have stone absorbing. So it, it, it sort of feeds on itself and you end up with even more rapid. It, 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 isn't, it isn't like a nice steady, you know, melt per year, it's an accelerating melt because of the changing dynamics of the mountains themselves. Um, so the future is going to be that we're going to run out of water earlier in the year, which is intermittent droughts, and there may be early season floods, especially when rain is falling on snow instead of snow falling on snow. So it's not, it's not a simple message, it's not like you're going to have droughts. You're going to have floods and then you're going to have droughts. Um, and rainfall may be increasing, the data there are um, uh, not, not convincing yet. So if that's the case, overall amount of water is less critical than the timing changes. Um, and uh, reducing water consistency for everything that farmers uh, have to do, hydropower, drinking water and the like. Let's talk about desertification, the definition dry lands becoming desert. You know, dry lands, you can live in dry lands, just go to Phoenix, um, but deserts do not support human life, putting it bluntly. So these are the dry land regions of the world in yellow. They're sensitive to desertification. So it's a, it's a wide swath of planet Earth is uh, not desert, but could become desert. And this um, uh, is exacerbated from overuse of land, farming, grazing, global warming, climate variability, and as I said earlier, vegetation, animals can't survive, people will migrate. Climate change, agricultural processes, pra practices, political processes, and population pressure. Political processes are perhaps most dramatically illustrated by Bolsonaro in, in Brazil. So if you um, do not enforce um, environmental regulations and um, you permit the burning of the Amazon rainforest and the expansion of, of grazing and farming, then that's a political decision that is uh, um, independent of climate change per se, but is exacerbating climate change. And keep in mind population pressures too. When I was, a, when I was born in 1954, uh, there were about 2.4 billion people on Earth. Today there are about 7.7 .7 billion people. This is in my lifetime, in the lifetime of many of you. you. So, um, population pressures cannot be ignored in this, in this environment. So, you know, what drives seasonal rains, strong seasonal pressure gradients between the land and the sea, and a hot uh, land mass uh, contributes to this. Warm oceans supply moisture. The warmer they are, the more moisture they supply. And that is the fuel for cyclones, monsoons, and the like. And uh, sufficient recycling of rainfall by plants, the so-called so evapo transpiratory process to allow moisture to reach deep into the interior. So if we uh, cut down our uh, rainforests, if our dry lands uh, become deserts uh, with loss of uh, uh, botanic biodiversity, uh, all of these things could be exacerbated. Here's the Sahel. And uh, the Sahel, as you can see, you can imagine somebody possibly living there. They, they could do grazing, they could do some farming. There's, a, there's a, a stream coming through. It's a dry land, but it's habitable with low population density. Um, it means shore in Arabic. Um, and it certainly is a sort of a shore against the, 
the, the desert, if you will. Um, it and lies between the desert and the fertile grasslands of forests in the south. It has long dry seasons and, and shorter wet seasons. It, and drought has brought a lot of famine, misery, and hardship to the south and Sahel part of the world. And uh, the Sahara Desert is taking over large swaths of the Sahel. I was last week in, in the Sahel. I was in the first in Sudan and then I was in Chad. And the folks in these countries are exquisitely aware of desertification. They know exactly uh, what's going on. And, uh, and part of the pressure um, of the whole Darfur Kurdifan crisis of, of a number of years ago, which in a, in a low-level low way continues to this day, because a lot of those people who were displaced are still displaced, um, was a fight over land that uh, the Janjaweed uh, wanted to do ethnic cleansing so they could take over the land because of this phenomenon in part. So the Sahel has been aff heavily affected by desertification and the term land degradation tends to be um, applied to human factors like overgrazing uh, when, and we use the term desertification more when it's more related to climate change. But they're obviously highly related concepts to desertification and land degradation. So that's what uh, Africa looks like in terms of true desert uh, and uh, risk of desertification. So if you just look at the yellow and the uh, light brown, you'll see the zones that are most uh, uh, likely afflicted by desertification. Um, and here is um, the Sahel uh, there, just to remind you. So the Sahel steppe region is the one just before the Sahara, and that uh, very much is uh, desertic, it is desertic, desertic, fine, whatever the word would be. <laughs> that is precipitation anomalies in the Sahel, and you see the ten, tre, trends are, are drought conditions in the last uh, 40 years compared to historic norms. And uh, long periods without rain are uh, now the norm in the Sahel. And uh, whatever migration we've seen to Libya and elsewhere, it's going to get much worse. Now, what are we going to do about this? What are the mitigation elements here? You certainly don't expect to withdraw from a global climate agreement whose design is to keep uh, global warming to less than two degrees centigrade in the next 30 years. That is not what one thinks of as an effective policy response to what I've just shared with you. And uh, it will take an election to change that because there is no uh, minority voice in the White House suggesting that we get aggressive on climate change. There are minority voices in, in the Republican Party. There are some very articulate and intelligent leaders in the public Republican Party who are powerful advocates uh, for uh, action in global climate change. After the, the actual word conservative implies that you shouldn't let this happen to Mother Earth, uh, you should conserve. Uh, so I, and, and, and the uh, Yale Center for Climate Change Communication, Tony Lazarowitz's operation, he'd be a great guy to come to give you a talk. Uh, Tony's operation that does uh, nationwide surveys has documented year after year after year that a majority of people who vote Republican believe that climate change is real and is substantially contributed to by human activity. So why then are politicians voting the opposite if their own constituents, a majority of them, believe this? And the answer, I think, is evident to you. It's where are the fossil fuel lobbying dollars going? And they are going to reinforce um, one party more than another, and uh, and uh, and it's almost a condition uh, of being assisted to be reelected that you go anti climate change, even though a majority of Republicans in the United States uh, believe that climate change is real. So I don't see this, and I've never seen this as a political issue. I, I, I see this as an issue of corruption in our society. I don't I don't think it has to do with Republican versus Democrat. Because you, you, you see these surveys and they're, they're inviolable. Year after year after year, a majority of Republicans believe that climate change is real. Um, technology sharing for renewable energy and forests. Um, there's a lot that we know that other countries could benefit from. There's some things that other countries know better than we. And the notion that we would help India with solar power 
um, and that uh, that uh, um, certain policies around uh, uh, irrigation practices would be promulgated based on what the Israelis have done in the Negev Desert. I mean, there's a lot of global exchange where we could substantially help each other do much better. Um, tax and other incentives to align with social good, the whole concept of uh, carbon offsets, um, and, and, and the whole concept of the state of Connecticut, when my wife and I went solar uh, last uh, March, uh, we got 3,000 bucks back from the state of Connecticut. As long as we did an energy audit for our home, and the energy, energy audit of the home cost 150 bucks, and I estimate I probably got $1,500 worth of value from that energy audit. And then uh, I'm getting a, a little bit of m money back from the feds as well. So there is some effort to, uh, to align uh, tax and incentives. But if you buy an electric car next year, those are gone because the current administration hasn't seen the merit of having uh, incentives help drive um, personal decision-making around, around uh, um, energy efficiency. Um, now, I'm an upper-middle-class guy. Do I really need those subsidies? Maybe not. But there are a lot of lower-middle-class people who own homes who do need those subsidies. And maybe they should be, they, maybe they should be anchored on income. All sorts of possibilities to... Uh, maximize u utilization of solar solar power. Um, and then the whole concept of carbon sequestration research. If there's any holy grail in the field of research in climate change, it will be carbon sequestration. Are there practical ways to actually take carbon out of the air? And there are some pretty clever chemists and, uh, and physicists and uh, engineers who think that this is feasible. So can we get to carbon neutrality by actually taking carbon out. Now, there's lots in local policy, transportation policy. Do we need to have so many vehicles? I, I crowed with my cousin in Norway at, uh, around Christmas time when we went to visit. Uh, he's a guy who has been doing transport policy for the Norwegian government his whole career. Now he's retired. And I crowed that you know, we, went electric, we went electric and then we got rid of our Prius and bought a, an electric car. And, and uh, so now I'm driving a whole solar vehicle. And he just looked at me, shook his head, he said, you need to get out of that car. You need to be taking public transportation to work. And, uh, and uh, he explained his rationale, and he's absolutely right. Um, mine is a halfway measure. If I want to go for a full measure, I'm going to take the bus or the train. Um, so transportation policy and incentivizing people to do the right thing to get out of their cars and into, into public transportation. Subsidized energy efficiency, as I already mentioned. Personal leadership. We didn't, we didn't go solar just because we wanted to. We were hoping our neighbors would notice. And one of the happier days the last six months was when one of my neighbors came over and asked for the background on what we had done to go solar. He was a, he was a retired engineer, and he thought it was a good idea, and he's going to go solar. So the notion that people in this room if you go solar, are you going to transform the earth and we're not going to have climate change anymore? I doubt it. But are you going to provide local leadership and you're going to send a message to your neighbors, to the voters in your community, that you think this is important? The answer is yes, you are sending that message. Reducing energy consumption and waste. Uh, for example, uh, could we survive uh, with 75 degree uh, thermostat in the summer and 66 in the winter? Put on a sweater and save vast amounts of energy. This is exactly what the Europeans have been doing for years, which is why they're uh, a big part of why their energy consumption is less. So let's move on to coronavirus. Um, uh, coronavirus, not such a uh, you know 50-year story, uh, really a story of a few months. Um, we did have the severe acute respiratory syndrome, the first time coronavirus had come into human beings in a lethal way. A friend of mine. Uh, um, um, is a coronavirus expert, he's a pediatrician at the Vanderbilt University where I used to work. And, uh, and he was a sort of a novelty person. He was studying coronaviruses and they're very interesting viruses and they occasionally cause human disease but it tended to be mild. Well, you get these civet cats and the bats and the next thing you know, it's off to the races and you remember what happened in Hong Kong, you remember what happened in Toronto, etc. Um, but it burned itself out. Uh, partly because of global 
response, but also um, the summer came and uh, this traditional winter respiratory viral season uh, burned out and it did not recur the next season. Probably more uh, uh, an epiphenomenon than a human response uh, uh, relationship. So uh, then we had the MERS and MERS was less infectious, uh, attributable possibly to camels, we still don't know, uh, bats originally, it's always bats and then, and then, and then they get somewhere. And uh, because that's the natural, that's the natural uh, uh, host of coronaviruses is bad. There are 200 strains. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about three. So um, it ha was highly lethal. Uh, mortality rates 30% and above, but not very common. And now we have the no novel coronavirus, and, uh, and I've already mentioned these definitional issues. So it is more um, infectious. Uh, than the original SARS, and uh, but and somehow it, it, it but it's less um, it's it's less lethal. That's what it says on the on the part that's below the screen. Sometimes we transition to the max and we lose a little bit something from. It. So um, uh, let's compare it to flu. So influenza is about uh, uh, what we call a basic reproduction rate. The number of people who would be likely to get infected based on one introduction of the virus um, is probably about two and a half um, and, uh, and coronavirus looks from our data from China looks like about two and a half. So it's, it's a comparable infectiousness to influenza, which is a pretty infectious uh, virus. Um, and it is anywhere from 10 to 20 times more lethal than, than flu. About one in a thousand deaths from flu about one in a hundred to two, two in a hundred in, uh, in, in coronavirus. Now, many of you remember the new news headline uh, from Tedros, the head of the WHO, saying it was 3.4%, but that's not from good seroepidemiology. That is from a pool of infected individuals who were detected. So there's probably a pool of infected people who were a little bit on the subclinical side. So I don't think when the when the, when the story ends that it's going to be as high as 3.5%. Uh, but it could be very well 1%, which would still be 10 times more lethal than the flu. So you all recall that uh, Wuhan was the city epicenter in uh, China. Um, 84 countries, and you know, whenever I do a talk like this, I have to check the morning, and I forgot to do that this morning. It might be 90 by 100, 100 already. Uh, yeah, these, these slides are like two days old. Um, and uh, it, it's now, I know for a fact, over 122,000 cases um, and, uh, and uh, uh, over 4,000 deaths. So uh, it's gone uh, quite rapidly, globally. You know, uh, there's some debate, is this a pandemic? Well, if you have an epidemic, which is a surge of new cases far beyond baseline, and it jumps continents, by definition, it's a pandemic. So for reasons that are obscure to me, uh, WHO reluctant to call it a pandemic when it's unambiguously a pandemic. And now, by the way, when you go to a place like uh, Sudan and, uh, and Chad, where I was last week, um, they do not have the capacity to test. So one of my Yale colleagues on the telephone the other day, when we had one of our many coronavirus calls, said, well, uh, maybe we can send our medical students to Uganda because they'll be safer there than they are here. And I had to correct them. I had to say, we don't have a clue what's happening in Uganda. We have Excuse no me. clue. Yes. I just wanted to say, uh, about an hour ago, WHO declared it a pandemic. There you go. Okay, better late than never. Thank you. You know, I should do this talk in a completely different format. You should all be on your, you should be updating me in real time. I'll, I'll have to remember to do that. Now this is the mortality uh, from um, Chinese data, uh, and I think they also had some Korean data, and uh, and uh, this is well, this is the reality that we're for reasons we don't fully understand, it is not the typical mortality curve where the very young and the very old are most afflicted. The very young seem to be relatively uh, spared from coronavirus toxicity. But you know, we do see that in some other viruses, uh, a varicella, chickenpox. Um, if you've got chickenpox as a very young child, six month old, eight month old, tends to be a very mild, benign disease.
It's more severe if you're a four-year-old, and it's much more severe if you're a 20-year-old. So we have seen some, some viral illnesses that for reasons we don't necessarily understand being much more benign in younger age groups. So this wasn't a huge shock. But this 15% mortality in people um, uh, uh, over the age of 80. Now again, this, this mortality rate is based on people who came to the attention. The denominator here is people who came to the attention. It's not based on good zero survey in the community. So these would be seen as maximum estimates. The real estimate is going to be somewhat lower, but the comparative analysis is probably dead on accurate in terms of relative uh, relative uh, risk. So, uh, uh, older folks, people with pre-existing medical conditions, much much higher risk. And we know that bats are the natural host, and we've had a variety of um, intermediate hosts. I read a paper yesterday that just was published day before yesterday. Uh, in uh, Cell, uh, one of the prestige uh, journals, and uh, they think it's pangolins. So they're, they're, they're pointing to pangolins the way that 20 years ago they pointed to civet cats, but we're not sure. Um, this is the relative sort of uh, infectiousness, measles being one of the most infectious agents to afflict mankind. Um, uh, if, 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 if none of us had the measles vaccine, and none of us, let's say we lived on an island, we didn't get the vaccine, we, did, we never got measles as a child, um, and somebody with measles walks in and has lunch with us, we would have a virtual 100% attack rate. The basic reproduction rate for measles is probably 200. Just incredibly infectious. As a pediatrician, we were terrified of a measles case showing up in the, in the waiting room because any susceptible child in that waiting room, including parents, would get measles. That's why we're so obsessive about high vaccine coverage rates. We, want, we don't want 80% coverage, 90 For measles, we want 98% coverage. We want virtual total coverage. That's how infectious it is. Um, Ebola, quite uh, dangerous, especially late in the course of illness. You remember the stories of people who were burying, burying their loved ones, and they were the ones who were at highest risk. Uh, SARS, very infectious. COVID-19, very infectious. And all of them, uh, sim uh, uh, SARS and COVID, uh, similar to influenza, which sweeps the globe, globe yearly with varying lethality depending upon the circulating strains. Flu has no trouble catching hold in human populations and, and becoming pandemic. And uh, this happens every single year. So what we're trying to do now is we are trying to snuff out COVID-19. We are trying to minimize the penetration of the population to avoid death and illness, but also we'd like to keep the absolute numbers of cases to the bare minimum so when the warm summer season comes, perhaps it will die out on its own. If we have too many cases and too many people incubating late into the spring, could some of them, um, a, a, a fraction of them, continue to be infectious into the autumn and start the, the cycle all over again? So that's part of why you're seeing such an extreme response uh, to this uh, outbreak. So my colleague uh, at, uh, at the Yale Saad Omer wrote this in the New York Times, many of you may have seen it a couple weeks ago, and he pointed out that what we need now is political leadership and stewardship. We need to let the scientists lead and not interfere with scientific judgment. Uh, we don't need to have a lot of false assurances. We don't need hysteria either. We need a balanced scientific presentation, and we need rapid dissemination of of scientific information. This is not the time for a, for a manuscript about, about coronavirus to be sitting in the peer review process for the next nine months. You know, we need mechanisms for a quick release of data. Um, this has now been designated for several weeks now a public health emergency of international concern. Uh, the gentleman mentioned it's now deemed a pandemic by the WHO. Um, we are talking about travel restrictions. Um, Yale has asked all of us to not travel for Yale Business internationally, if we're traveling locally, I mean if we're traveling uh, per for personal reasons, to reconsider. And, uh, and local travel is also being uh, restricted. The less social intercourse that we have, the less opportunity for the virus to spread. And the term you've heard is social distancing. So uh, Yale is announcing that they're going online for education through April 5th. Harvard, Princeton, Yeshiva, Hofstra, Holt, Raft, Stanford, and the University of Washington did it last week. So there's a whole raft of, uh, 
of, uh, of universities that are trying to increase social distancing because they have crowded dorms and they have crowded classrooms. So um, they're telling people who are on spring break, maybe you should stay in Oklahoma or in uh, New Hampshire and not come back to New Haven uh, and do your coursework distance. And I think that's a rational, reasonable thing to do under the circumstance. And then quarantine. But you look at this and you say, that's all well and good. What's going to happen to the tourism industry? What's going to happen to the convention industry, the hotel sector, uh, the transport sector? Um, we already know what's happening in global supply lines that are very globalized and depend on products that are produced in places like Wuhan, China and elsewhere in China. And whether the product is produced there or whether the components are produced there and shipped elsewhere, so I don't think that, uh, you know, pe people say that the markets are, are irrational and they're plummeting because of hysteria. And uh, honestly, uh, global impact of this epidemic, of this pandemic on, uh, on economic uh, vitality of major industries is pretty substantial. So, you know, I hope the market for the sake of all of our retirement funds goes up again, but I mean, ultimately, uh, a lot of people are saying, look, you know, this is going to be, uh, this is going to make SARS, which was a multi-billion dollar impact on the globe, this is going to make it look like a, a, a walk in the park. Now, what are we going to do? When you're coughing and sneezing, cover your mouth and nose with flexed elbow or tissue. I am, I am the worst kind of cougher. I'm a hand cougher. Doesn't do me any good when I shake your hand. So I am trying to retrain myself to be a sleeve cougher and sneezer. Uh, immediately use a tissue and immediately discard the tissue and immediately wash your hands. Um, so this is, uh, you know, classic stuff, isn't it? <laughs> this, is, this is the kind of thing we, you, we, we teach our kids. Uh, and then when traveling, you want to avoid close contacts. I don't know if you heard about this United flight, but it had to be diverted and they had to take off a bunch of unruly passengers because there was somebody with allergies who was sneezing and coughing the whole flight and they went nuts and they went nuts in a, in a way that it, I believe is illegal from the point of view of, uh, of uh, transportation safety. So they were the ones removed from the flight, not the person who was coughing, but uh, I shouldn't laugh. But this is the kind of thing that people panic about, you know, uh, and uh, they, they can't avoid close contact. They're on an airplane, for goodness sake. They're, they're in a closed space. Frequently cleaning your hands, avoiding touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but I am a face toucher. I'm doing my hair, and I'm scratching my beard and everything else. And for me to get to avoid touching my eyes, nose, or mouth, I need a personality transplant. But uh, ultimately, that is a good thing to avoid, and I'm trying my best to avoid it. But I shouldn't even be touching this, this, uh, this dais, this podium, and I've been touching it the whole Keep in mind personal protective equipment, which is used by caretakers and healthcare workers. Um, and uh, we have ways to teach people how to gown, how to put on masks, how to put on the, uh, the sort of shield, the helmet, and how to put on gloves. And uh, whether you're in a nursing home or whether you're in a, uh, a hospital setting, a clinic setting, or you just happen to be the caretaker for somebody with coronavirus or suspected coronavirus, we, are, we have a major shortage of, of personal protective equipment. Um, this stuff expires. Sometimes the rationale for expiring is very dubious in my judgment. I think we ought to take a serious look at uh, rationale for expiring equipment like this. Because it seems to me just to be uh, sort of convenient for the stuff to expire so that people manufacturing can sell more. And uh, it doesn't have the same rationale that a vaccine or some drugs have for expiring. But maybe I don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to end with a, with a reminder about, some of you may have seen this, it's kind of gone viral. Um, get it? Uh, but uh, it's, it's, the, it's the balance of controlling the virus with human rights issues. And this is a training video that has been used in um, China. So pay attention.
就来一起唱，最后能唱哦。朋友，准备先一起，搞个队，欢迎各位搞个队，请你喜欢，配合节奏，请配合节奏，配合喜欢，配合节奏。What was the rationale for that? When we face <coughs> pandemic threats each and every year, and the previous administration recognized that that ought to be handled, at, at least for coordination purposes, at a White House level. One of the first things done, wiped that entire office out. Uh, the Paris Accords need to be re-engaged and recommitted. There is anxiety management versus honest messaging. There has to be some balance here. Um, I don't live in fear of coronavirus. Um, um, I'm trying to do reasonable efforts to avoid it and try to avoid it in my community. And we're trying to do reasonable efforts at our university like all the other campuses, and you'll do that in your workplaces. But, uh, but it's not time for utter sheer panic. Um, uh, honestly, 98% uh, um, of people who get sick with coronavirus are not going to die. Um, and then uh, on the climate change agenda, we, I think we need to consider climate change and health in every single policy, whether it's agriculture, nutrition, wetlands, forests, and on and on. We want to use modern tools for both of these challenges. We have world of data sciences. I don't know if some of you are familiar with the whole world of social media diagnostics, sort of Google Analytics type stuff, where we're actually learning a lot about what's happening in society by just seeing what people are, are texting and what people are querying. Um, Vaccine, drug, biologics, uh, diagnostics, getting mass production of the coronavirus diagnostics is absolutely essential now. Um, and we had a draft coronavirus SARS vaccine that's been on the shelf for over a decade. Now, should we have, should we have deployed that coronavirus and, and should we have carried it to fruition and should we have done human testing even though SARS went away? Well, if we had, we might have a cousin of the current coronavirus that would have, we would have had a vaccine that plausibly would have been partially effective. Even without a perfect match, genetic match, it might have been partially effective. We did the same thing with Ebola. We had an Ebola vaccine based on the uh, epidemic in Congo about 15 years ago. We put it on, we developed it, it looked promising, put it on the shelf. It sat there for over a decade, then came Liberia 2014, um, uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone and we didn't have the vaccine at all. Then it was to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up as people were dying of Ebola, and then they developed the vaccine, deployed it, turns out it worked fine. So we are very relaxed about making progress and then stopping progress. Why? Because we don't perceive it to be an immediate risk. Well, SARS didn't come back that year. Oh, the Ebola is gone from Congo. And I think it's short-sighted. I think that's where a White House Office of Pandemic Response might have a, a broader 10, 20-year vision. Um, the NIH is making decisions, you know, do we carry forward the respiratory syncytia virus vaccine, which is killing children every single day, every single year, or do we carry forward the SARS vaccine, which isn't killing anybody? So I get why NIH makes these judgments, but somebody's got to have a longer view. Uh, we need nanotechnologies for exposure assessments of cofactors. You know, uh, smoking is a cofactor for all of the uh, respiratory viruses. Um, air pollution is a cofactor. There are a lot of cofactors, and we have the ability to do a better job. And we definitely need a Manhattan Project for carbon sequestration. We know we can do miracles in science if we set our minds to it. 
and our, and our resources. And then we need scale up of existing technologies, renewable energy and energy conservation, and then for coronavirus travel and quarantine strategies. So thank you for your invitation. I'm happy to take any questions.